right, uh, how do you do? For my 20 percent time project, I've elected to study uh, animation, and not just general animation, but more like the history of animation and how uh, people invented things to help push it along. And of course, uh, since it's a history, I'm just going to go briefly through all these things. It takes a long time, all right? And of course, a question I felt like the need to answer would be why? And it's mostly because I want to do this as a profession, but also because um, I find it interesting to learn about a lot of the things that I watched when I was littler, like Scooby-Doo and not SpongeBob because Scooby Nickelodeon, but you know, those types of things. So, since this is a history, I started off with the, old, the oldest animation I could find, which is the lovely title, Humorous Phases of Funny Faces. Now, each of these little drawings was simply doodled on a blackboard, and they took a picture of every frame of drawing and compiled them all together to create motion, but obviously it's a blackboard, it's not actually moving. And right off the bat, a big uh, lux luxurious company started with Max and Dave Fleischer, who of course, founded Fleischer Studios. It's a beautiful name. And it all started in 1915 when dear old Max over here, uh, he didn't like the way animation looked. It was really choppy, um, everything moved robotically, so he created the, the, the rotoscope. Now, the rotoscope, if you see over here, is a big box. Wow. Now, in this box, they would put a reel of film of someone walking or jumping, dancing, whatever they needed to animate, and it would project it over here so the artist could draw over it and make it look very fluid and actually how people move. Wow. And as they were, I know this is really complicated, I'll explain it, as they were continuing on in their years, around I think the 1920s, he wanted to put more depth into his animations. They were still very flat, I know animations are all 2D, but he wanted to help that. So this fancy little thing is called a stereo optical camera, but you could just call it a setback camera. It's a lot easier to pronounce. And numbers uh, two through six were all part of the set. Now, number one is where they would draw a character. And it was on a piece of clear celluloid plastic because they couldn't draw it onto the set. But the way the camera worked, it would project the character onto two so it looked like it was in its surroundings. Now, three and four were all things in the background, like uh, little miniaturized buildings, bushes, anything that needed to be in layers. And number four was hills and mountains in the background, with five being a giant sky, but it was just painted on canvas and it could roll around with the entire set. Seven and eight helped it all move because no one really wants to pick up a bunch of little buildings and move them accordingly. They just wanted to all roll around. Seven was a giant rotary table that this all sat on, and eight would crank it so it could move. Now, if what I just said was kind of hard to process, that's what it actually looks like. Now, of course, you can see the big box right there is a camera and everything that helped control it. This is the little miniature set they would have with, obviously, the sky. If you look really closely, there's a little Popeye drawn on the celluloid, but of course it projected it onto the set. All right, so the first major achievement they made was they were the first people. Where's the one? Dude. They were the first people to create a cartoon that featured a character talking. They did this by partnering with Lee DeForest, who specialized in radio technology and sound, but here, got it. Thank you very much for putting up with me. Uh, how they were able to make it all come together. Oh, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. 
<laughs> Obviously, Kayla loves it with this little pot like that. Too. Okay. Obviously, they use the rotoscope to make it move. Wow. And if you look behind him, you can see all the different layers of the stereo optical camera. <laughs> <laughs> But eventually everything came crashing down. <coughs> well, they were obviously able to make quite a few cool characters. I'm sure you've all heard of Betty Boo mm -hmm. from yes. your parents are just around and eventually they were able to animate Superman. They didn't create him or Popeye but they were able to get the licensing to do it. Wow. But in 1942, they were having a very difficult time finding things to animate. They couldn't make a profitable, a profitable cartoon, so they had to rely on their old stuff. And because they couldn't progress, they started going into debt. Paramount, their parent uh, company, was getting very mad at them because they couldn't make any profits. So on May 27, 1942, Fleischer Studios completely shut down. Which leaves room, this is kind of hard to see, for Disney. Disney is great. Disney was doing well before this, but they were able to flourish really when Fleischer Studios shut down. Uh, some of the things they achieved beforehand was, come on, click, they already had Mickey Mouse in their stock and they had already uh, done the Snow White feature length film, which was the first uh, animated feature length. Wow. They were also the first people to combine sound and color. Fleischer got sound down, but they were able to really bring everything together. Okay. And then World War II came. Now, World War II cut almost all of Disney's over the seas profits. They lost almost everything and had to not shut down, but I want to say hibernate in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, during this time, though, uh, this is a really funny name, Oob Iwerk was able to create his own version of a stereo optical camera called the multi-blend camera. Now, I'm not really going to go into it because I already explained the last one, but it was basically a stereo optical on its side. This big thing up here is the camera, and these were all the different layers of the scenery. And it helped them create beautiful images like in Bambi. Now, Mary Poppins really helped them uh, dig themselves out of the hole that World War II had created because it incorporated live action, which they were doing quite splendidly, but it also has a lot of animated sequences and was the first movie to feature an audio animatronic when she holds a robin on her finger. Wow. And then he died. Oh. <laughs> In 1966, <laughs> Disney... He's dead. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. And this didn't have much of a toll on it because they still had, of course, their main animators and who I work was still working, but they had to quiet everything down for a while to help deal with the loss. Now, most of Disney's work was feature length. It was like a movie, and you went and you watched it in a theater with your friends, your family. They didn't really um, show them on TVs, but they did have TVs, and on Saturday mornings in the 1960s, they started broadcasting cartoons, mm. and the people to really take advantage of this was ha, William Hanna and Joseph Barbera. Now, they met together working at Metro Golden Myers Animation Division, but uh, eventually they shut it down because they thought hey, we have enough cartoons to keep us going, we'll just use the old stuff every once in a while. But they were able to land on their feet, and in 1957, they founded HB Enterprises. Now, they found almost immediate success with a lovely show called <laughs> The Huckleberry Hound Show. And with this new success, they, of course, changed their name to Hanna-Barbera Productions two years later. Now... Hanna-Barbera was really well known for coming up with the Flintstones, which was kind of the first animated sitcom, I'd like to say. And in the 1960s, they came up with quite a few other splendid shows, like The Jetsons, 
and Yogi Bear. But as the decade was coming to a close, they um, came up with a wonderful idea for their most successful show yet. Oh, yeah. Where are you? Oh, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> this was Nate's favorite show. Uh, <laughs> so I own every single one. There's no options. I love the show. I own every single movie. Oh my god. Dude, 1969? Yeah. Nice. I see your money. That's two years old. Alright, alright. So, it's just numbers, right? But, at their prime time in the 1960s and the 1970s, Hanna-Barbera produced 80% of all cartoons, and on Saturday mornings, if you flipped on the TV, you had a two out of three chance of immediately watching a Hanna-Barbera show. They took up that much space. Wow. Yeah. And uh, obviously TV is really demanding. You have to keep pushing things out. You can't just make a feature length every once in a while like Disney did. So they were able to streamline their production so they could keep up with the rhythm, which they brought limited animation to the screen. Now, of course, an example of this would be Yogi Bear's Run. They, of course, didn't draw this over and over again. They just used the same clip over and over. And a lot of other companies scrutinized this from the, for, scrutinized them for this. God, I can't speak. Like, mm -hmm. Disney called them lazy and uh, unproductive because they were really focused on high detail and beautiful scenes where they just wanted to be funny, all right? <laughs> Kids don't care. Now, of course, more big words. In the 1990s came a new uh, kind of form, a new era of animation, animated licensed property, which is just a funny name for toys got cartoons. And, um, some of them would be He-Man, oh, yeah. My Little Pony, or <laughs> TMNT. <laughs> now, on top of this, there was no longer just Saturday cartoons. They would air all the time. And I looked this up. If I wanted to watch Scooby-Doo over on this side of the uh, country, you would have to get up before 6.30 to watch it, which is really disappointing. Fun little battle. So now there was more spots to fill, and they couldn't keep up with that. They had oh. limited animation, but creating enough content for every day of the week just, just really isn't enough. But they found salvation in these funny little characters called the Smurfs. This helped them along in the 1990s, but of course, like Fleischer Studios, it, it just wasn't enough. They dropped to 20% on production. Oh. They completely switched, and instead of 80, sadly, they dropped by a whole 60. Now, still hard to see. Many apologies, but I thought it looked cool. TBS, Turner Broadcasting Studio or System, said, hey, we'd like to buy your company. And of course, they were dying. They obliged. They gladly took the money and handed over all of their cartoons to them. Of course, William Hanna and Joseph Barbera were still able to work for them, but it no longer belonged to them. And they created a lovely thing called Cartoon Network. And in the 1990s, <gasps> <No>. <laughs> in, in the 1990s. now of course Hanna Barbera was dying. Almost oh. all of their animators and writers left. Oh. They didn't want to stay there and watch it completely fail. So they brought in an, a bunch of new lovely people hmm. with a bunch of lovely ideas. Yeah. For things like Dexter's Lab, Powerpuff Girls, Johnny Bravo, um, <laughs> Cow and Chicken, anything else uh, we probably watched. <laughs> but of course, uh, Hanna Barbera was still dying. Um, although they gave their cartoons to TBS, Warner Brothers still took over. They consumed wow. them. They're now dead. Rest in peace. So, around the, we're going to take a step back. So, around 1979, this guy, you might have heard of him, probably did it. George Lucas yeah, was. <laughs> he was really interested in graphic animation, hence Lucasfilm's computer division. That's what the guy looked like. Mm. He wanted, wanted to create images and sequences using computers. Now, Mr. Gonzalez, I think you'll appreciate this. The first completely computer-generated uh, animation sequence for a live-action film was in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Whoa. And they created all of this, of course, 
using a computer, as I said. Yeah. And this is the first completely computer generated image. They were trying to progress, but of course you can't jump immediately onto something and expect to get something beautiful. You have to work from the bottom and this this is the bottom. <laughs> road to point raise. Now, of course they were getting better. Time had progressed about a decade later, they had their first um, animated shorts called Ooh, The Adventures of Andre and Wally B. Now, everybody that actually did this it was shown at SIGGRAPH, which is just kind of like a Comic Con, but for animators. Oh, wow. Now, in 1986, Guy, probably don't know him, uh, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs bought the company and he named it Pixar. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So he, Pixar. Okay. he named it Pixar. Now, in 1986, the same year, they came out with a short called Luxo Jr. And obviously, they were they were nominated for an Oscar because it was the first kind of time anyone had created a completely three-dimensional uh, short animation. Now, of course, they continued on for a long time, wow. uh, creating things like Tin Toy. I just wanted to include this because that I baby. Yeah. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> and this little fellow, the animation is called Nick Knack, was the first time someone had created a graphic animation using what's it called? Stereoscopic 3D. And again, just a fancy term for when you go to a 3D movie and everything's in red and blue, and of course they give you glasses. Kind of looks like this. We all know what it is. Oh, yeah. Oh. So in 1991, they, Pixar and Disney decided to work together. They said, hey, let us create a movie. And so they started working on little sketches, and I'm sure you can figure it out through this, on a beautiful little thing that in 1995 became Toy Story. It uh, was the highest grossing movie of that year. And a couple days later, Pixar's IPO, which um, means people could now buy stocks in Pixar. They offered the company out. You could buy in. It was also the highest of that year. Everybody could appreciate this, this movie. John Lasseter actually won an Oscar this time for his work on the movie. It was that popular. It was that grand of a time. Now, of course, Disney and Pixar decided to team up for the next 10 years. They said, hey, let's create five movies over the next decade. But this resulted in Disney just straight up buying Pixar. But Ed Catmull and John Lasseter, in this agreement, assumed leadership and took over Disney's animation department. And <laughs> Last year, in 2018, uh, of course, Incredibles 2 became the highest uh, grossing debut for an animation ever, and therefore their um, highest, most appreciated movie. Wow. Now, I was going to wrap it all up with this lovely little thing called Renderman. Now, Renderman is what they use to make every one of their sequences. Every movie, it helps them, of course, render and make everything look smooth and nice. And for all the other companies I've talked about, uh, what they've set out for the public, the Fleischers had the rotoscope and... Please excuse this interruption. It's part of your presentation. All right. <laughs> Anyone who wants to be an ASB next year, please come to Mr. Martin's room during lunch if you're interested. Thank you. Have a great day. Really? Okay, so uh, the Fleischers had the rotoscope and the stereo optical camera. Of course, Disney gave us stereo, stereo audio animatronics and what was it called? The multiplane camera, which was really just an upgrade. Um, Hanna Barbera gave us limited animation and they gave us Renderman. They released it to the public in 2016. 
So anybody can use their animation software. You just can't use it for commercial purposes. And I'm also leaving it here because I really hope to one day not just be able to use this on my own computer for my own time, but to get an internship and hopefully work with Pixar. Thank you. Any questions? Questions? Oh my god! Alright. It was just it was part of it.